Welcome everybody to Micromobility Europe. I am absolutely delighted you're here. For that matter, I'm absolutely delighted that I'm here. <laughs> and I know as you're starting to settle in, drink some of your coffee, figure out which neighbor you want to sit next to, you might be wondering why they chose me to be the MC for Micromobility Europe. The reason I'm here today is because I've spent my entire career focused on climate, climate and equity outcomes for mobility in cities. I've done so from multiple perspectives, in government, in business, in not-for-profits, in academia, and even, as you see from this picture, on bikes. <laughs> right now, I'm the principal of urban transformation for the climate action nonprofit RMI, or Rocky Mountain Institute. There, I lead a new initiative called Climate Aligned Urbanism, or working with cities globally to accelerate equitable climate action through land use, housing, and transportation. To me, figuring out how we can create community-first mobility solutions that uplift individuals while preserving our planet is the central question for the next 28 years, or that is between now and 2050 which is our deadline for maintaining global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. But really, if we're being honest, we have just eight years, or between now and 2030, which is our decisive decade. And that's because that's the time period in which we can mitigate the effects of climate change. After that, we're just adapting to it. So I have a small confession to make. When I was originally planning this talk, I was going to give 10 minutes of reasons why micromobility has so many benefits. But then I spent approximately 30 seconds in Amsterdam. I took about 150 photos exactly like this one. I watched while young, old, everyone in between rode their bikes, e-bikes, e-cargo bikes, and these mini golf cart things that I haven't quite figured out what the word is for. And I realized that the last people who need to hear about the benefits of micromobility is all of you. You already know that micromobility is better for the environment. You know that it gets you further, faster. You know that it's good for your health. You also know that it saves you money, and it's good for the local economy. So instead, what I've decided I can offer this audience is maybe some perspective and some provocations. And in that spirit, one of the things I wanted to do is share with you the five things I think we need to do in order to meet the micromobility moment. And really, for that matter, to meet the moment overall in terms of what we need from mobility. The first thing we need to do should be obvious, and that is to stop expanding car-based infrastructure. I say it should be obvious, and you might be thinking, Julia, it's 2022, we don't need to tell anybody to stop expanding roads and highways. But just for example, in Bangladesh, they're spending 100 times more investing in highways than they are in walking, cycling, and public transport infrastructure. And this, this is the 710 freeway in Los Angeles, where I'm from which until about two weeks ago, they were going to expand in order to reduce traffic. At RMI, some of my work is about making sure that people understand and people quantify the congestion and the pollution impacts of metro highway expansions in order so we can stop them. But equally, I think we have to uh, start thinking about the actual costs and the opportunity costs of when we choose to make billions and trillions of dollars or euros of investment into infrastructure like this. When you do that, what are you giving up? And that leads me to my second point. What we're giving up is networks of mobility infrastructure. When we stop spending money on things like highways, we can start spending money on things like this. When I was at the mayor's office in Los Angeles during the pandemic, we built as many bike lanes in one year as we had in the past three years combined. And the reason we were able to do that, the reason why we wanted to do that, is of course because people needed outdoor space. But to be honest, it wasn't enough. In places like in Paris, where Mayor Hidalgo is uh, committed to building an additional 180 kilometers of bike lanes 
by 2026, this type of transformative investment is actually moving the needle on reducing transportation emissions, and it's changing people's behavior. Those first two things are good, but they only matter if we take one of the biggest climate actions, building housing. The connection between land use and transportation are not new. I probably don't need to tell you about them. But the thing is, we're not doing anything about it. <laughs> and when they did an analysis of 120 cities uh, across the world for the IPCC report, what they found is that in two-thirds of them, urban land was expanding faster than population growth. And this was true in North America, but it was also true in Europe. And in the latter half of the century, it's going to be true for Asia and for Africa as well. If you're for micromobility, you have to also be for housing. And where we build housing matters. One of the things that I hope you think about as we're looking at all of these beautiful micromobility options, as we're thinking about mobility, is that sprawl will be the thing that ends us. And by us, I'm also talking about micromobility. Because you can't take micromobility for short trips if there are no short trips, if there are places that you need to go that are 25, 30 kilometers away. The fourth thing is about pricing. Housing for cars and for trucks, so parking, uh, thinking about um, roads, uh, other types of spaces, has been free for way too long. And there's a growing awareness about how this needs to change, whether it's in, the, uh, in London, which you see here, where there's an ultra-low emission zone and many other things that start to correctly price uh, roads and parking, or in Washington, D.C., where they just recently announced a new SUV vehicle charge. So they're starting to pay, uh, have people pay more when they buy heavier cars. We have to start correctly pricing roads, cars, and trucks, and parking. Which leads me to my final point. So this is the fifth strategy. And that's about providing micromobility for all. It will do absolutely no good for any of us if micromobility is for just a few of us. And we have to have micromobility for all, whether it's shared or whether it's privately owned. And I think sometimes there's a misconception about whether or not this is good for business or whether or not you should start a business by thinking first about accessibility or access to your vehicles. One of the things uh, that we did recently at RMI was produce some research for a state in the US called Connecticut. And what we did in the research is look at uh, the capital expenditures, the operating costs, the profitability of different mobility options for low and medium income communities. When we did this, when we compared the capital expenses, when we cared the operating costs, compared the operating costs, when we cared compared the cost recovery, and those are the three charts you see up here. The cheapest to purchase, the cheapest to operate, and the most profitable was micromobility. The point here is that as we're looking at all of these beautiful micromobility vehicles, and I do hope you take a lot of time to go to each and every one of those booths, to take some time to listen to the pitches and everything else that'll be happening today, that you also think about who these vehicles are for, who can have access to them, where they're distributed, and whether or not they're designed with everybody in mind. Because the main question I want to leave you with as I'm finishing up these slides and starting to introduce the next person to speak is about whether we are going to miss the micromobility moment or whether we're going to meet it. And for that, when I need inspiration to wake up in the morning, when I need inspiration to work on reducing transportation emissions, when I need inspiration to think about how to do that equitably and with everybody in mind, I think of three things. I think about how uh, <laughs> in 2021, almost miraculously, e-bikes outsold electric vehicles in the US by 200,000 vehicles. I think about how in London they've launched the e-scooter trials and riders have taken a half a million trips, totaling 1.6 million kilometers. 
And I think about in the Philippines, within nine months, they did something much more impressive than what we had done in Los Angeles. And they built 500 kilometers of bicycle lanes on national roads. So with that said, again, I wanted to uh, give you a very, very, very warm welcome to Micromobility Europe. Uh, let you know we have an action-packed, thought-provoking agenda, and I will be here along the way with you in order to welcome you through, uh, inspire you, and hopefully provoke you.